Path, the Steampunk Death Proto channel. This is the one channel that's dedicated to steampunk fiction. The wonderful blend of sci-fi, fantasy, and history that's the most cool and imaginative genre out there. Today I'm talking about a thing that's a staple of steampunk fiction, more than the omnipresent goggles, more than the steam engines that gave it its name, the airship. It's hard to imagine a steampunk novel without airships in it. it whether it's not the central setting or plot, plot element of airships, may or may not be, but even so, you, you expect them to be there. You expect them to be soaring in the city above the skyline of London or New York or wherever, or Paris or wherever it's taking place. And at one point or another, the characters will often uh, travel on an airship to exotic places, perhaps like Egypt or Japan. Before we talk about airships in fiction, I want to do a little bit of a background on airships in fact, in, re in real history. Because, of course, they did exist and they do still exist in a limited fashion. First, we've got to define our terms. What is an airship? Well, airship is a form of air transportation. And it is one of the two, class, two types. It's an aerostat versus an aerodyne, which is like an airplane. Aerostat is something that can fly without moving. It can just float up there because there's lift gas in the case of an airship. And as far as an aerodyne, like an airplane, it has to keep moving or it's going to fall out of the sky. And that includes the helicopter, even though the helicopter can hover, those blades have got to keep moving because they are the ones that provide lifts. If the rotor breaks or stops, boop, which is what makes a helicopter a particularly difficult uh, thing to learn how to fly. So, of course, as far as types of aerostat, we had the original, which was hot air balloons. And hot air balloons are interesting in that they're mostly for either for pleasure or for research. Uh, there's very little use in transportation because a, a balloon goes with the wind. So you can't go where you want to. You go where the wind takes you. Which is why when you're up in a balloon, if you've been, if you had the good fortune, and I have been once and I loved it, uh, when you're up there you don't feel any breeze at all because you are moving with the breeze and it's very quiet. And you see these little tiny people in vehicles way down below. It's amazing. But the difference between that and the airships that are seen in steampunk is that the latter are dirigibles. The word dirigible comes from a French word meaning steerable, meaning that a, a dirigible can go against the wind or in any direction it wants because it has propulsion and it also has a stirring fins and so on. Now the history of, of uh, aerostats is very fascinating. It wasn't until the late 1600s that they got really serious you know with some drawings and some plausible plans I believe it was 1709 when the first actual hot air balloon was launched without a, without a person in it by a Brazilian Jesuit priest, uh, Bartolomeu de Guzmão. I don't know how you say that. And um, he made a hot air balloon that floated up above Lisbon and you know, fascinated people. Now it wasn't until for like 70 odd years later that the Montgolfier brothers, Joseph Michel and Jacques Etienne, launched the first piloted balloon in 1783 and after that everything changed everything moved very rapidly in 1785 just two years later Jean Baptiste Marie Musnier crossed the English Channel in a balloon equipped with flapping wings for propulsion and a bird-like tail for steering so this was the first real dirigible uh, there was an Australian William Bland sent uh, designs for his atomic airship to the great exhibition at the Crystal Palace in 1851. I've got to talk about this. I have to have a video on that because that's another central point of steampunk, this fab, fabulous exhibition in London. Kind of like, the, I think, kind of the first of its type. And uh, this was, this airship was like the elongated balloon with propellers. Henri Giffard, Giffard, I think, in 1852, he was the first person to make a, an engine-powered flight. Uh, 27 kilometers in a steam-powered airship. And in 1863, Solomon Andrews uh, invented this Arion, which was unpowered, but it was controllable, and he wanted to give it or sell it to the U Union Army for the Civil War. And it's interesting because the U.S. Civil War was a time when 
uh, balloons were, were widely used as surveillance and so on, and scouting. And this came to the interest of a Prussian military officer, who happened to be in the States at the time, named Ferdinand von Zeppelin. <laughs> and uh, he, when he got back to Prussia and he retired from the military uh, in his early 50s, I believe it was 1891, he founded his airship company, you know, hiring a, all these engineers and so on to design his rigid uh, shell for the airship. Now this is, this is the type, this is one of the types of airships we have. The non-rigid, the gas bag that inflates from the pressure of the gas, which is like a blimp, the Goodyear blimp is, is a, is a non-rigid. You had the rigid ones like Zeppelin, uh, and which have a, have a skeleton of like very light material like aluminum, which holds the bag together. Uh, and you have in between, there was semi-rigid, which had usually a rigid keel that, that held, had it kind of hold its shape, but wasn't as much weight as the rigid frame, which was kind of a nice compromise. So anyway, Zeppelin's company was so successful that it became synonymous with airships, so to the point that we talk about a Zeppelin as a, you know, as a powered dirigible that's synonymous with, with the category, like Kleenex and Escalator, even though it was a trade name, <laughs> uh, uh, it's become a, basically a common noun. Uh, now, there were people at the time who were thinking, this is going to be important in war. And in fact, H.G. Wells wrote a book called The War in the Air, which I'm currently reading, uh, in 1908, talking about a German air attack on, on New York City, <laughs> which is, it's a pretty interesting interesting uh, description of a fictional battle. Of course, it didn't quite turn out that way. In World War I, they started out using them for some bombing runs in 1917, and uh, it didn't work out well because the airships were so vulnerable, especially because at the time, their lift gas was a highly flammable and dangerous hydrogen. So all you had to do was hit it with a, get a lucky hit with a bullet, and the whole thing would go up like poof in flames. So they basically had to pull them back and only use them for surveillance, like, they, like the hot air balloons had been used in previous wars. Uh, but at the same time, in between the wars, the uh, airship became a staple of uh, civil aviation, and, and the, the Zeppelins flew back and forth across the Atlantic and became a very genteel and rich person's way to travel, much faster than the cruise ship, but still very luxurious. And it's interesting to note that, uh, that the Zeppelins, that the Zeppelin company wanted to go to helium, which is a very much safer gas, which cannot burn, less, less lift than hydrogen because it's a heavy, heavier element, however, much, much safer. They wanted to go to helium, but they couldn't because at the time, the U.S. had an embargo on selling helium to the Germans. Uh, could be because the funny little mustache man came to power, but anyway, um, in 1837, as we all know, the horrible, horrible tragedy of the Hindenburg when it burned. I mean, they had the flammable aluminum paint on the on the covering the gas bag. That caught fire from a static spark, which lit the hydrogen inside the gas bag, which we all know, the horror, the horror, all these people jumping out. Actually, like over 100 people survived, believe it or not, because they were close to the ground. And one of them even survived till the early 20th century, 21st century. Uh, but anyway, that was the end of civil aviation with airships. Uh, I, I believe that they flew, they finished any, all flights that were in progress at the Zeppelin company, and then they basically sh shut it down. This is too dangerous. Of course, World War II happened very soon thereafter, so uh, that, it might have been differently had that not been the case. Now, again, during that war, the U.S. did use uh, balloons and so forth, and, and airships as um, a surveillance and scouting things. But of course, the airplane had really come into its own, and there was no way that they were going to use such a vulnerable thing. Even with helium, they can be shot down. I mean, it's it's they're kind of slow moving, and they, you know, an aircraft can come in, zip it with bullets, and and, and you're and you're finished. <laughs> so it never became a big deal. Although there's been talk lately. In fact, the U.S. Department of Defense had some big projects to do this special high-altitude hybrid vehicle that was going to uh, revolutionize high-altitude surveillance. Unfortunately, it got canned in uh, 2012 because it was, surprise, surprise, 
uh, late and over budget. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate. Um, they've also talked a lot about air sh using airships for heavy lifting. In fact, there's a British company called Airlander that does this giant one with this kind of weird double, haul, double gas bag. From the back, it looks like an enormous butt. So in England, they call it the flying bum. And unfortunately, the flying bum hasn't quite gotten off the ground either, financially speaking. Hopefully, it will soon. Because it would be a great way to lift heavy loads that airplanes can't lift in places where there aren't roads, in places where, the, where ocean travel isn't practical. Uh, you know, places like Africa and the Amazon, I suppose, would be a good application for that. There's also um, travel, including the idea of scenic flights. I, I believe these have been done sporadically here and there. Uh, there was a company in California that once that advertises airship ventures on online, although they're currently not available. And I don't know if there was any like safety concerns or it was because of the insanity surrounding COVID, which in California was one of the worst places outside of China uh, for restrictions and, and nonsensical rules. So it may have been part of that, but but I'm hoping that that'll come out come out soon. I know there's ideas of, for sightseeing, there's a Swedish company that wants to do tours over the North Pole in the next couple of years, and that is unfortunately going to cost like $65,000 for a cabin for two. Uh, a little bit out of reach of most people. I would like to see it used in more common uh, sightseeing touristy things. For example, the Grand Canyon. They used to have helicopter flights, and there were, I believe there was a fatal crash, and then people complained about the noise. So now there's only airplane tours. But can you imagine an airship? Like they're they're quiet, just hovering majestically over the Grand Canyon. You could paint them in like, you know, the canyon colors, like the, the reds and the browns and stuff, and they they blend right in. They'd look so cool. And they would like they would like uh, complement nature's beauty with uh, some man-made beauty. And I, I would really love to see that sort of thing. Of course. You know, the FAA is unfortunately kind of stodgy, and it, it's really kind of hurt the idea of uh, advancements into other types of air travel. And finally, the idea of the people who are worried about climate change, the idea is that airship travel produces only one-tenth of the carbon emissions that airplane travel does. It's slower, but much more environmentally friendly. And although I don't share the hysteria of people like Greta Thunberg, <laughs> I do think that it's it's a problem, it's a long-term problem we have to solve it, and airships could be part of the solution. Now let's go on to, to the steampunk elements of airships. Now like I said, it's hard to imagine a steampunk novel without airships in it. And just for fun, I did a web search of, of uh, airships in fiction, came up with a Goodreads list, uh, just one example, Goodreads list of 75 books well, mostly books, a few animations and so on, of uh, airship-related fiction. Almost all of it looking steampunk. It's crazy that I had only seen like 11 of these. And uh, considering that I've read well over 130 steampunk novels, it seems like I've got a ways to go. <laughs> but it, it's of every sort. I mean, sometimes you, a, lot of, a lot of you have airship battles, like in uh, The Warlord of the Air. Then you have airships as a primary and important means of transportation, like uh, in, uh, I believe, in several of Gail Carriger's Solus books, they get around airships, and there's some of this intrigue, kind of like Orient Express type intrigue in there, which is which is fun. Then you have, and in fact, in my own book, Fidelis Automata, I have the characters traveling by an air, airship, which is, which in my world was created by a fictional entrepreneur, the, Mar the Marquis de Morris, who in my world survived. <laughs> he, in the real, real life, he died in a um, battle in North Africa, with some kind of weird political skullduggery he was into. But um, a fascinating, fascinating character. So, so it, it appears in all sorts of fashions. Sometimes it's just a backdrop. Sometimes it's a form of symbolism. Uh, because uh, airships are kind of like ocean-going ships. And, and human beings have been sailing this, the seas for millennia, for many millennia, and it's, 
and it's like the alien environment where we don't really belong. So it's got this mythic intensity for us. It's got this feeling of exile and separation from human society. It's not the same with airplanes because they're so because they're fast and they're kind of impersonal. Whereas the the airship it gets a name and kind of a female character like like the ships of old had. Uh, so types of imaginary airships. A lot of them are historically accurate hydrogen type zeppelins. There were some of them in the late 1800s, but they were not used for commercial air travel. Of course, it is easy to extrapolate that they could have been because well within the reach of their technology. And of course, they were they had the intended, attendant danger of fire. Uh, there were other writers that posit the, the switch to helium, this much safer helium. And those include the stories like that take place in the a hypothetical present. I believe they used helium in World Out of the Air, definitely in The Two Georges by Harry Turtlelove and Richard Dre Dreyfus. <laughs> uh, yes, the actor Richard Dreyfus was on that one. Um, interesting book. And and in my own Fidelis Automata, they had already switched to helium. There, there is some difference in configuration. I, I since actually the big airbags are usually can consist of cells, various cells, so they can't all deflate at once. There's the idea of a com combination of features of the aerostat and the aerodyne. For example, the, the uh, winged airships of, uh, of mortal engines, like the famous and wonderful Jenny Hanover. And of course, you have biological airships, like the mutated whales in uh, Leviathan, that uh, produce hydrogen in their bodies, so they can float in the sky. And uh, and uh, again, in Philip Jose Farmer's The Wind Whales of Ishmael, which is a, a fantasy sequel to Moby Dick, in which Ishmael wakes up in the far, far future when the oceans have mostly dried up and these whales float in the sky and humans have make, make these airships in order to hunt them. And then we have the idea of lighter than air, air metals in uh, Clockwork Heart by Drew Pagliasati, which, in which case, People can fly with their own flap of their wings, which is not really an airship, I guess. But it is an aerostat in the sense that it doesn't require movement. Uh, finally, before I forget, a lot of uh, steampunk type writers go completely fantasy and talk about magnetic levitation or some other hand wavy science, which uh, is prevalent in a lot of anime such as uh, the Last Exile, in which case the, all these warships, these floating warships are all, they don't have airbags. They're, they're all like magnetism or some other mysterious force holds them up. I believe in John De La Rosa's Blood of Giants, which is part of the Baron Von Monocle series, I believe that's how they were as well, uh, because the description, I don't recall there being an airbag in there. So, even so, I guess that is technically, even though impossible, um, a form of aerostat. Finally, before I close this long and rambling exposition, I have to talk about why airships appeal to the human imagination and, you know, why we steampunk writers like them so much. First of all, I think it's partly that they represent a convenient and technolo technologically appropriate way for steampunk characters to travel quickly and conveniently across the world so that the plot can move forward. Secondly, they look cool. They're beautiful and majestic, floating above the cities. Uh, you know, airplane can't come in so close unless you have a terrorist trying to destroy something, uh, whereas Whereas the airships could theoretically dock at the top of the Chrysler building or, or whatever. Especially the look of them appeals to makers of animation and graphic novels. They represent a simpler and more genteel time. You know, even if that gentility was not universal, even if there was a lot of poverty and it was accessible only to the rich, it does represent um, a more elegant time when people could sit in the lounge and sip tea or have a cocktail and gaze down upon the bustle, hustle and bustle of the great cities like London or, or, or Paris or New York and uh, not have to be cr cramped and, and crowded into a tiny seat and, and not allowed to even stand by the, by the lavatory. <laughs> 
they are more accessible to the characters. They're, I think it's less, it's less training to learn to fly an airship uh, rather than an airplane, which can easily come down and crash. In, in The last, last Exile, that wonderful animation, even kids do it. They inherit this little personal uh, magnetic airship from, from their parents and they're flying it all over the place as couriers. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, I think people love the thought of airships because air travel in the present day has become so disagreeable. It really has, and it's gotten worse every year. You've got this invasive security, which is sometimes completely nonsensical, like here in America where you have to remove your dang shoes, where they won't let you carry a bottle of water on because they think it's explosive, which is the, the, the likelihood of anything actually being a real threat is next to zero. And yet they have to have a security theater in order to impress us. <laughs> uh, there's the cramped seats. They, get, they seem to get smaller every year. There's the rising prices. And then of course there was the COVID insanity with uh, stewards screaming at you for lowering your mask to take a drink or whatnot uh, during the height of that paranoia. You don't see that in the airships of fiction. And of course there's the fire hazard, which which is interesting in an era when smoking was very, very central to culture, how that was dealt with. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's, it's why I think airships will continue to uh, be written about in fiction and, and hopefully they will come back into our present world in the much safer helium incarnation and uh, I hope to have, be able to ride on one someday, and maybe you do too. So please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please like and subscribe. Help us get out the good steampunk gospel. And for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, I do some egos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.